the scripture that we're talking, what we're talking about is the eyes of the Lord. Okay? Uh, Revelation 1.14, when John saw the revelation of Jesus, when he saw him, the presence of Jesus, one of the things he saw, his eyes were as a flame of fire, piercing eyes. And Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Every one of us, every person on the face of this earth has to do with the living God. Everyone. No one will escape. Everyone will have to do with the living God. And nothing, all things are manifest in his sight. 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open. His ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now Peter was not speaking to the world. So, and but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Peter was speaking to the church. Okay? Many people see that because we are under the grace of God and we are qualified through the merits, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And they say, but now, and there was a guy standing here in, in this hall that said, um, God doesn't see me. He sees Jesus. So he doesn't see my wrongdoings that I've done. <clears throat> he ignores that. He only sees Jesus. He only sees the righteous Jesus in me. Well, you show me a scripture where that is true. It is not true. There is no scripture. When God looks at us, the scripture, he says, even his word pierces through, dividing asunder between soul and spirit. And as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now if that is so piercing and so powerful, how does God see us through Jesus? What he does see is that his divine grace has made us and, and qualified us to be partakers of his inheritance. And the power of the Holy Spirit is to empower us to overcome those things in our lives. Not that we're perfect. Thank God he's made a way. 1 John, the book of 1 John was written to the church. Some people say, no, it wasn't. Well, it was written to the church. And if we sin, verse 2, chapter 2, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And in chapter 1 it says, if we will confess our sin. But now you say, but we are righteous. We, we don't have to confess sin. There's many preachers that are preaching that. Well, we have to do with the living God that has eyes that are piercing through. He knows every thought and intent, every purpose of our hearts. There's nothing that we can hide from Him. And we need to see that the eyes of God is piercing. But, thank God for His grace. That when we have <coughs> done something, we can come to the Father and say, Father, come boldly to the throne of grace. And it says why? To find mercy. Why would we need mercy? Why would we? We're born again. Why, and, and Jesus, uh, if it's true that God only sees uh, righteousness, how come we will find mercy? Because we need it. And we need the blood of Jesus and we need to confess our sins to God. He's faithful just to forgive us. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even those things we don't know that we do. Or have done wrong. Or have said things that are not right. But his eyes are piercing. In fact, he writes to the church in the book of Revelation chapter 2. And he says in verse 18. And to the angel of the church at Thyatira write. These things says the Son of God. You know, there are many people said, oh, Jesus didn't declare, declare himself to be the Son of God. Well, here's one of them. Many, many times Jesus declared himself to be the Son of God. Okay, there's some religions that don't, that said, God has no Son. Well, Jesus said, I am the Son of God. This is a title that God has given him at the Godhead. 
He is the Son of God. These things says the Son of God, who has eyes as the flame of fire. There it is again, eyes as the flame of fire. Why? And ears like, um, eyes as the flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your surface, your patience, and as your works, the lost and before. And he sees the thoughts and intents of the heart. And many times we need to pray, say, Father, reveal my intents of my heart. Because sometimes we cover up things. Oh, that's not my purpose. Oh, no, no, I didn't want to do that. Okay? But what is the thought and intent of the heart? We cannot hide it from God. And thank God He can reveal it to us that we can repent. Say, Father, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse me from that. But He has eyes as the flame of fire. All things are manifest in His sight. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. So the eyes of the Lord is very important. And for us to understand and realize what God is searching. In fact, um, one of the prophets, he says in 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, talking to the king, he says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. You see, God sees beyond the natural. He sees the heart of every one of us. He sees the thoughts, the attitude and intention of the heart. When God rejected Saul and said to Samuel, go and anoint one of Jesse's sons. It wasn't Jesse James. It was Jesse in the scriptures. Okay? Go and anoint. So, of course, Samuel went there. He saw this handsome, big guy. And he thought, this is the eldest. This must be the anointed of God. And God said, no. I have rejected him. I have rejected him to be king. He's not worthy to be king. Because the man, the natural man looks on the outward appearance. But God says, I look on the heart. And there was one perfect heart before God. That's what David did. And the scripture also talks about David in all that he did in all his life. Only once did he miss God when he went with Bathsheba and then caused not only adultery, but also the fact that uh, he made sure that Uriah was killed. So only once. But he had a heart perfect towards God. He had a heart to seek God. He knew that God sees the heart. And even though he tried to cover the things up, God wouldn't allow that. And I see these things happening in the world today that you saw, and there are serious things happening. But God is not going to hide the preachers that have hidden behind their pulpits, hidden behind their wonderful gifts. God is not going to allow them to do that. He will expose them. His eyes are piercing, that they can repent and not be condemned with the world. That each of us can repent of what we've done and make sure that we haven't hidden so many things the scripture talks about. I mean so much about false prophets, false teachers. Come out with gimmicks. You know this, uh, the scripture talks about the books that are opened in, 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 he in heaven. And if our names are not written therein, that's eternal damnation. And the scripture says, and the books were opened. And there's one book I believe is there. It's called the Gimmicks Book of Records. For the preachers. For all the gymnastics, spiritual gymnastics they pull. I cannot believe that people are so gullible. Because somehow, the church when we receive Jesus, when we get born again, somehow there's a book passed on to us. And it's called Gullible's Travels. And we become gullible and not sober thinking. And the devil pulls all these things and people believe it. I mean, how on earth can you believe this? An entire church, in fact, an entire uh, Christian community believed the preacher that said, listen, God has told me that he's going to cancel all your debts. 
But you must bring it and put it, make an altar. And we're going to burn that altar. <clears throat> but don't forget, you must give, I think it was $100 or something, with every debt that you're sending in. And I'll tell you something, you can look it on the internet, I'm not going to uh, expose names here. Um, it, it was a massive pile. <clears throat> I'm talking a massive pile on their platform of debt. Do you understand how much money they're building? That's a gimmick. That's a gimmick. God says in his scripture, if you owe, you better make sure that you pay. He's, not, he's already paid for our sins, thank God. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above ask or think or imagine, according to the power that works in us. But he's not going to do our job for us. But we can trust God for wisdom. We can trust God in business. Help us, Lord, overcome this situation. But there are no gimmicks. Because you can burn that debt and say, and then the, the creditors phone and say, hey, listen, what about this? Oh, no, it's been burnt. Oh, really? Well, it's not in my bank account. So don't allow the spirit of deception and <clears throat> to overtake any one of us. There's amazing things that these guys say, and people believe it. We need to be discerning. We need to realize the eyes of the Lord. God is seeking. When he looked at the earth, when Noah was, <clears throat> after Noah was born, in fact, the scripture says that he didn't find any righteous except Noah. All he did was find corruption, and everyone had corrupted the way of God. Every thought and imagination of, of man was evil. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because Noah was righteous. God called him righteous. Noah was righteous, and he walked with God. Enoch walked with God. And Enoch was not, for he was taken. He was raptured into glory. And Noah is the fourth generation from Enoch. And the scripture says Noah walked with God. And God wants us to walk with Him. In fact, God saw way beyond that man, and he saw the redemption through Jesus Christ, that we can be sons and daughters of God, that we can spend eternity with him. That's why Jesus said the parable, the pearl of great price, the one pearl. And what Jesus was saying, that every one is important to him. He doesn't just see us collective. He sees each individual. One soul that comes to know him, one soul, Heaven rejoices over one. So we are valuable and precious in the eyes of the Lord. And He's seeking to bless us and to encourage us, to strengthen us and to empower us. We, we find that God is looking for a perfect heart in the sense of, Lord, I want to know you more and more. I want to seek your face. I want to walk in righteousness and truth. Because righteousness has fruit. The scripture talks about the fruit of righteousness. If we are righteous in the eyes of God, born again, cleansed, then we have fruit. Jesus said, bring fruit, meat for repentance. John the Baptist said, bring fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, there must be a change in our lifestyle. There must be, by the grace of God, the power of God who empowers us to overcome these things. Um, in Proverbs 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 5, 21, The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and ponders all his going. Psalm 34, verse 15, The eyes of the Lord are open to the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. God is for us, who can be against us. And let's not stand on the side and when people are, are trying to live uh, right on the edge. I just want to make it to heaven, but I still want to carry on doing all, all of these things. You see, a heart that loves God. Because you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your life. Everything that was within you. And with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is fulfilling the royal law. Because if you do that, you're not going to harm your... your uh, 
relationship with God, you're not going to harm your relationship with anyone. And if you've done something that's, Father, forgive me, or go to the person, forgive me. And I will be strong in the Lord and overcome those things. You find the kings in 1 Kings 15 verse 5. David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah. <clears throat> there was a king called Omri who reigned over Israel for 12 years. Um, and it says that Omri, this is 1 Kings 16, 25, he brought evil and did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then we find Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, he began to reign over Israel, 1 Kings 22, uh, 41. And it says, and he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father, and turned not aside from doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't turn from anything that he knew was right. And I believe it's our calling to not turn aside and do all these things, but turn to the Lord and do everything that we know that is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. All of these things that is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Look at this scripture. He that says, this is in 1 John chapter 2. Verse 6, he that says he abides in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked. To walk is a lifestyle. Those of us who say we belong to Jesus, <clears throat> we abide in him. We ought ourselves to walk even as he walked. How did he walk? Okay, he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. You see, He knew that He was totally obedient to the Father. And He always did that which was pleasing. And He knew that whatever He prayed, God would honor that prayer and God would answer because He walked in the fullness of the Father. So He always did the things, always do. So there are many Christians that say, oh, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to do anything. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We can do anything we want. And God just loves us. Dangerous territory. Whoever you submit to, his servant you are. Whether of sin unto death or righteousness unto God. That's what the scripture says. And so many people, so many Christians, have believed those lies, those doctrines, part truths, and they've accepted it and lived like it, and Satan has gained advantage over their lives. So, now in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, John writes, and he says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. So if our heart condemns us, what, what is it? We don't have boldness. Why would your heart condemn you? Because you've done something wrong. Your conscience will bug you. Your conscience is the voice of God's law written on our hearts. That's what Romans says. In fact, Adam and Eve opened their conscience. It wasn't so much the fruit that they ate, but the disobedience. And that tree was the knowledge of good and evil. How do you know that you've done something wrong? Your conscience tells you. Oh, but you show me a scripture where it says that. Show me a scripture that I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, let me tell you something, your conscience. And Romans says that even their conscience, even those that are not believers, their conscience, if they've lived according to their conscience, their conscience will judge them. And they'll be judged according to their conscience and how they've lived, according to the law that is written on our hearts. So, if our heart condemns us, <coughs> to, uh, we have confidence, condemns us not, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments. And His major commandment was the commandment of love. And we do 
we do those things that are what? Pleasing in His sight. So it's not just a party that we could just go, oh, I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. I'm going to heaven. I don't even know how that song goes. <clears throat> but the oaks sing it and, and are very happy to sing it. But are we doing what is pleasing in His sight? And we know when we've done something that's not pleasing. We know when our attitude is not pleasing or whatever we thought. Lord, forgive me. It says, let the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto Him. What do we meditate on? What are we meditating on? Let that be pleasing unto the Lord. And many times, if you wake up in the morning, many times it's in the morning, um, if you just begin to meditate on a scripture, a scripture will come, or a song, or something, and wow, okay, there's, there's the word of the Lord right to us. God wants our lives to be pleasing unto the Father, that His ears are open unto our prayer. He sees everything. And God wants us to walk in His fullness and <clears throat> be clothed in righteousness, in His righteousness, and walk in the fruit of that righteousness. Not by our own strength. Because if we could do it in our, on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we can't do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to overcome this. Lord, help me to walk pleasing unto You. And <clears throat> offer the sacrifice of praise. Right in the midst of all of that. So the eyes of the Lord are open to every person's heart. Every person's need. Lord, reveal my heart. The psalmist said, Lord, show me. Reveal my heart. Search my heart. If there be any wicked one in me. And David was caught out. God did search his heart. And he tried to cover it up. But rather... Let's say, Father, search my heart. The eyes of the Lord are over everyone. Bring it to the light. Sorry? Bring it to the light. Because the moment you do that, the moment you say, Father, you don't have to expose it to anyone, but you come before the Lord. You see, anything that's hidden has power, has power and control. But when we come to the Father, Father, forgive me. Lord, show me. And when God shows you, thank God, even through the prophetic word, even through the preaching of the word. Some people have often said, how did you know, who told you about me? No, no one. The Spirit of God knows what every one of us need. And reveals our heart that we can be cleansed, we can be pure, that we can be cleansed of all unrighteousness, that we can have fellowship with the Father. That's what God has called us to that our fellowship, as the Apostle John said, that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Jesus Christ, the righteous. God wants fellowship with us. We're going to spend eternity with Him. So thank God we can sort things out now, in this life, before it's too late. But we are the messengers of God to carry the grace of God, to touch people's lives with God's grace, what He's done for us, that we can share with others the divine grace as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We can share that grace, share that love, and let God is looking. We are the pearl of great price, and He's looking that, um, to show Himself strong on our behalf, whose hearts are perfect, whose hearts search for God. He knows, and let Him minister that love and that power to each one of us. And we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit, strong in the Lord, and not turn aside, not allow these things to take us away from the very presence of the living God. He is. The eyes of the Lord are as a flame of fire. What a fearful thing it would be to stand before the great white throne judgment and God looking through and seeing those people, seeing and exposing. Do you know that in, there's no time in eternity? Time doesn't happen. And in an instant, our entire life can be shown at the judgment seat of Christ, before the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and give an account of everything that we have in, 
everything we've done, everything we haven't confessed, everything we've ignored, when those eyes and the judgment of God pierce through, I want to tell you something. <clears throat> I had a glimpse, just a glimpse, of the judgment seat of Christ. And I couldn't believe what God showed me. What God saw in my life and revealed it to me, I couldn't believe it. He says, as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. That was the biggest, I, I believe, the biggest shock that I've ever had in my life. But thank God, because of His love, because of His grace, He exposed what was in my heart. And He said, as much as you've mistreated even the least in the kingdom of God, you've mistreated me with a very same attitude. When I got that revelation, God help me and help us. Because not one thing, if we don't repent of it, if we don't uh, expose it now to God and say, Father, forgive me, not one thing will we not give an account of. And the scripture says that our works will go through the fire. Whatever we've done, our works will go through the fire. And if there's wood, hay and stubble, it will be burnt up. And it says, we'll be saved even as by fire, but no reward. And those things that we've done from a pure heart and, and led by the Spirit of God, helping others, doing whatever God has called us to do, uh, even phoning somebody, just encouraging them, those works, when it goes through the fire, will be pure, precious in the eyes of the Lord. And we receive our reward for that. But thank God that we, we're at a time... Many people don't fear God anymore. Many people in the church are falling away. They're falling away in their hearts. They're not falling out of the church. They're falling away. They're serving other things. All other things are so important. But one thing is, the fear of God is gone from them. One preacher says he fears God so much. <laughs> <clears throat> when you see Jesus and the Apostle John when he saw him in his glory, he fell at his feet as dead. When you see the awesome, awesome presence of God, there is no excuse. You cannot do nothing. But thank God, he's given us grace, he's given us mercy. That through his grace, through his love, we can, we can come to the throne of grace with boldness. Father, forgive me. And the attitudes of our hearts, the things that are hidden there, you see, we heard the preachers preach and said, oh, don't worry about the past. Don't worry, it's all forgiven. <clears throat> You're a new creature in Christ. Don't worry about that. Let me tell you something. The soul man is still alive. The soul man that knows all that stuff. The soul man that opened the door. Why? For the works of darkness. That soul man needs to then shut that door. Like Paul says, I crucified that old man with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I live now in the newness. And now we have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome the old man and let the new man grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides in us, that empowers us to overcome and be strong in the Lord, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your love. Thank you that, <clears throat> that Jesus stood in our place, received the punishment of our sin, that we could walk free, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help us in this time of need in our lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father.